You're watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following. and by viewers like you. The Middle East continues to be a focus of world attention including the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Palestinian terrorism, Israeli occupation of the West Bank, the question of Muslim extremism. With a good deal of media attention now being paid to the leadership of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who is the subject of a major editorial piece by David Remnick in a recent edition of his magazine, The New Yorker. And Netanyahu was profiled in an hour-long interview with CNN's new nightly interviewer, Morgan Piers. Well, for some insight into all of these issues, I am pleased to welcome back one of the world's foremost analysts on the Middle East and on Islam, the director of the Middle East Forum and the author of 12 books on these subjects, Daniel Pipes. And Daniel, it's wonderful once again to be able to sit with you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mark. This is the first time you and I have had a chance to speak since what is now being called the Revolution of Egypt. First of all, I want to ask you the question that everybody must ask you. Did you see it coming? And whether you did or not, Daniel, what's it all mean for Egypt first and the Middle East in general? No, I did not see it coming, but neither did Husni Mubarak see it coming, <laughs> so I'm in good company. No one saw it, no correct? One saw it. No one saw it. Well, we all expected a lot of trouble <clears throat> on his demise or his retreat. In other words, there were three parties, the Islamists, the military, and the Sun, Gamal Mubarak. He's now history and so forth. But we all expected things to get lively, but not quite this fast. Uh, you called a revolution. I prefer the term coup d'etat. Really? In other words... Who did it to whom? In other words, Egypt has been under military control since the coup d'etat, or revolution, call it what you will, of 1952. First was Mohammed Naguib, and then Gamal Abdel Nasser, and then uh, Anwar, Anwar Sadat, Sadat, and then Hosni Mubarak. All of them generals or colonels, all of them leading the military. What the military said to Mubarak a month ago was, you're a distraction, you're an ornamentation, you're a problem for us, go. How was he a problem, Daniel? Because he was, one, trying to get his son into power as opposed to the military, and two, he had become over 30 years the brunt of a great deal of animus. Not surprisingly, he did a lot of things that would make you or me upset too. So they said to him, go. And the military took over in its own name. And now it is a military council headed by the defense minister with the chief of staff and other generals as members of it that is running Egypt. But you're saying that the fact that the military is running Egypt is really not a substantive change. Well, it might be, it might not be, we don't know. But was the military in charge when Mubarak was president? Well, Mubarak was head of the military. Mm -hmm. So the military said to its head, go, well, we're in charge now. But it's not a fundamental shift. It's not like power went in some other institution or other leaders. It's still the military very much in charge. Now, what they're gonna do with it, I can't tell you, but the referendum that just took place, which was past 77 to 23, suggests to me that the military is inclined to keep things more or less as they have been. And therefore, I'm all, all the more inclined to call it a coup d'etat rather than a revolution. How interesting. You know, as we watched it unfold, whether we watched it on television or we read the New York Times or wherever people get their news from these days, the suggestion was made over and over again that this was a populist revolution. Well, it was in the sense that the the developments on the street, in particular Tahrir Square, were populist and revolutionary. But who got power? Not the Tahrir protesters, rather the Supreme Council of the military 
uh, of the armed forces. That's who got power. In any sense, was this a move towards Western democracy? That's yet to be d discerned. In other words, the, the Tahrir Square elements were remarkable in their openness, their patriotism, their sense of self-responsibility, their want, desire for, accounta for accountability. Perhaps the, the symbol in Egypt, as in Tunisia, was the fact that people uh, cleaned up after themselves. This is something that doesn't happen. I can tell you, I lived three years in Egypt. People don't clean up after themselves. They did. It was a sign of a new maturity. And uh, I think there were some very positive developments there. And they could yet be very important. They could also get swept aside. But what happened, there was a maturation process that took place there that was astonishing to me. They weren't talking about conspiracy theories. They weren't talking about blaming uh, others. They weren't anti-imperialist. They weren't anti-American. And they weren't anti-Zionist. They were talking about positive things. So I don't know what that will all amount to. But in of itself, it was a remarkable development. I still want you to clarify for me whether the fact that this coup d'etat ends up in the hands of the Egyptian military means that the people who were protesting or in some way, you, you do want to use the word revolutionaries for those in Tahrir Square, have those people been in essence disenfranchised? The a referendum that took place recently was against their wishes. What it did was touch up the Constitution, not make fundamental changes. And what it did was speed up the electoral process so that they, the Tahrir Square elements, will not have time or have a more difficult time to organize. And the existing party, Mubarak, and the Islamists, those existing parties, will be enhanced. So I can't predict for you. It's, it's everything is just much too okay. new. But so far, the protesters have managed to get rid of Mubarak. They have not managed to bring in a new regime. Mm -hmm. It's still the old regime. Now, the world looks to you as an expert in Islam. And I know you saw this as a major issue being discussed everywhere in the aftermath of Mubarak's departure. Would the Muslim Brotherhood ascend to power? And would what happened in Egypt resemble more of the 1979 Iranian revolution, which ultimately led to an Islamic fundamentalist state, as opposed to the 89 revolution in Eastern Europe, which in theory has moved more towards Western democracy. So the questions for you are, where do you see the Muslim Brotherhood fitting in Egypt? And although you, know, you can only predict so far and so much, do you expect in the long run this to turn out to be the opening of a door for Muslim fundamentalism in Egypt? Well, you mentioned 1979 and 1989. I'd like to throw in another date, 1992, in Algeria, where there was an attempt by, uh, there was an election that the Islamists were going to win. The military stopped the election and repressed them. There was a major insurgency. 100,000 people maybe died. That could be a third model. Um, I, as you say, it's hard to predict this. We're in terra incognita. We don't know. You know the, the, the old uh, models are no longer valid. And uh, so I'm a little shy about predicting. But I'm inclined to think that the military will keep a hold on power and that the Islamists will stay out, will be kept out. Uh, that's not to say the military doesn't have its own Islamists. After all, who, who killed Anwar Sadat 30 years ago? It was Islamists in the military. Uh, but the leadership, I think, will do its best to keep the Islamists at bay. There is, by and large, a uh, zero-sum game between the Islamists and the military. The stronger the Islamists, the weaker the military, in general, in the Middle East, and vice versa. The stronger the military, the weaker the Islamists. I think the military will remain in power and will uh, keep more or less the same practices as under Mubarak. That means this does not injure the relationship between Israel and Egypt. Well, I'd like to start by noting that Mubarak was no friend of Israel. Uh, By the way, he's I've, being portrayed. I know he is. That's Daniel, why I as if he is, emphatically was. want to repudiate that. In what way? Explain it. Well, one, 
under Mubarak for 30 years, there was a major buildup of conventional forces, tanks, ships, and planes. Uh, the Egyptian armed forces are the only potential challenge to Israel on the conventional battlefield, no one else. And conversely, who else could the Egyptians be building this up against? The Sudanese, the Libyans? Not likely. So, one, a, a real potential threat. Uh, not actualized, and perhaps never will be, but could be, could be. Two, uh, the fomenting of anti-Semitism, not anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism, including anti-Zionism, but deeper in Egypt. 30 years of uh, vicious uh, portrayal of Israelis and Jews consistently, some exceptions to be sure, but overwhelmingly this has been the portrayal. Three, uh, the Egyptian government has made trouble for Israel and international institutions on a number of issues, but most particularly uh, the nuclear weapons, trying to get the Israelis under uh, international regiments. And fourthly, uh, <clears throat> turning a blind eye to the arming of Hamas in Gaza. Most of the arms that Hamas has received have been through Egypt. You're not going to tell me the Egyptians couldn't isolate and uh, stop that gun running that took place through the tunnels and so forth. Those are a few examples of the way in which the Mubarak government was far less than friendly to Israel. And it could be worse, to be sure, but if this was not good, good relations. Could it be worse? Yes. Uh, were the Islamists to come to power? Definitely be worse. Um, again, I expect more or less continuity. The Egyptian authorities, the new ones, have formally endorsed their existing commitments but they haven't um, come closer. Uh, it's too new, it's too raw. But my, my prediction, if I must predict, that I'm a little shy about <laughs> predicting here, is that it'll be more continuity than change. Does that mean that you expect there to be continuity on these problems that you just listed for us? I would expect continuity in the problems as well. Okay. And in particular, um, the buildup of the conventional forces. Do you like the phrase that's often used, a cold peace has existed between Egypt and Israel, and a cold peace is still better than any state of war? Yeah, I think that's a good term. But I would note that there is no Israeli-Syrian agreement, peace agreement. There's no recognition and so forth. And yes, there were a couple of problems, a couple of hostilities back in the early 2000s. Uh, but overall, I think the Israeli-Syrian relationship is preferable to the Israeli-Egyptian because the Syrians don't have the kind of arms that the Egyptians have. I, I am very skeptical in retrospect about the 1979 peace treaty. I think it opened the door to the American arsenal, opened the door to the American um, uh, financial support. Build up in Egypt. Mm -hmm. without leading to a real peace. In other words, the Israelis were under the misapprehension that an agreement signed by a dictator like Anwar Sadat would <laughs> uh, trickle down and affect the whole population. In fact, that didn't happen. It became a government-to-government -government agreement with little implications. And the same goes for the Jordanian-Israeli treaty. Uh, it was not a change of heart. It was a formal declaration signed and didn't have that much impact. And so I believe now that the agreements that Israel signed should follow on peace, not memorialize peace. I mean, they should follow on peace and memorialize peace, not create it, not try and create it. You can't you go. You want peace first? I want peace first, as shown by everything from uh, hit songs to sermons in mosques to the media coverage, all the things that are so bad in Egypt, I'd like to see in a good, good condition before there's a formal signing by leaders. Otherwise, it doesn't have much importance. I don't, I don't ascribe importance. In fact, I would say, I'll go further. And so I lived in Egypt for three years in the 1970s, before any of the agreements. And during that time, while I wasn't in particularly political circles, I was getting around a bit. I was a foreigner interested in learning Arabic. And I spoke to lots of people. And Israel was not a subject that was on people's minds. And I had the sense that after the 1979 agreement with Israel, formal peace agreement, 
peace treaty, that Egyptians said to the government, we gave you our proxy. You betrayed us. We are now going to take back that proxy. And we will be on our own anti-Zionists. We don't need you, the government, to do it. We'll do it on our own. And you found a much greater hostility to Israel than had been the case before the Treaty of 1979. And I mentioned hit songs. There was a hit song, notorious hit song called I Hate Israel. And all sorts of attempts to boycott Israeli would-be product. Pepsi was deemed an Israeli product and was boycotted. McDonald's it was rumored that you bought a hamburger and some of the money went to Israel. All these sort of things that didn't occur back in the 70s. So I think things were actually worse with the peace treaty rather than better. That's not the goal of a peace treaty, is to aggravate circumstances. And the same thing happened in Jordan. There was discreet relations between the king of Jordan and Israel going back for decades. Once that agreement was formally reached in 1994, things got worse. The anti-Zionism of Jordanians came out more overtly and more strongly. This is so different than we normally hear. You're describing the relationship of people to people. In terms of <coughs> nation to nation, do you agree that there has been peace between Egypt and Israel? And when you compare it to the Syrian relationship to Israel and the fact that there have virtually been no hostilities on the Syrian border as well, without a peace treaty, is your point. Is there still some benefit to Israel to having something signed on paper? Ideally, you have a real peace between, between countries in which you know, both sides accept the other. That's not what we see in Egypt. The polling shows over 90% of Egyptians see Israel as an enemy. But so what? Well, what's the, I, let me reverse and say, what's the point of a, of a piece of paper that's signed by some defunct uh, dictator 30 years ago? What counts is what people think, not what somebody signed decades ago. Yes, but the nation never goes to war against Israel. Sure it could. If, if there's that kind of hostility, then that can be tapped for many purposes, both because there's an ideological devotion to this goal of fighting Israel, destroying Israel, or because you want to exploit this in order to you know, get to distract people because you've got other things on your mind. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's very dangerous. I would much prefer no treaty and 20% uh, hostility towards Israel than a treaty and 90% hostility. I, I, I have concluded, and this is important for the Palestinian uh, arena, mm -hmm. I have concluded that uh, signed agreements are not the way to go. The way to go is to get a change of heart. I am not interested in Palestinian Israeli more and more and more agreements, what the U.S. government is seeking, more agreements, more signed agreements. I want a change of heart. I want the Palestinians to accept Israel. I want that hostility versus Israel to go down. And at that point, sure, sign things. But that, that isn't putting so much of a burden on signatures. It's putting a burden on people's attitudes. I can understand everyone hearing you and being sympathetic to your overall perspective. But the question becomes, in reality, how does one affect the change of heart? Mm, good question. And, and very often the argument goes in the reverse, that if a nation adopts a, a posture publicly, it will trickle down and affect the population, especially if the government that makes the peace decides it's going to change the rhetoric that's seen on television and perhaps the rhetoric in textbooks and if you see an exchange of ambassadors, that that will in some way affect how people think. And, it's a good theory. And the, the but it's, in fact, what's not happened in the case of Egypt and Jordan. It has happened, by the way, in the United States. Meaning? We we were, I mean, when I grew up, the idea of Japan as a friend and ally was incomprehensible. But when the United States made peace with Japan and ultimately there was, enough, there was a specific attempt to change the way the movies were made, the way the wet rhetoric was made, you now have this sense that we are allies with the Small Japanese people. Small detail. We are allies and have been for a long time. Small detail. There was a signing ceremony on, I believe it was the USS Iowa, yes. in August 1945, yes. in which the Japanese formally admitted their defeat. Yes. We won, they lost. Yes. That is the key. And that's what I suggest one needs to have in the Israeli-Palestinian relationship is Israel wins, Palestinians lose. That's the bitter crucible of defeat that cannot be uh, finessed. 
and that's what's missing here. You want a public declaration. Well, I don't have to have it on a battleship and so forth, and uh, the general's coming in in white tails to sign. But I do think there needs to be a sense among the Palestinians, as among the Japanese or the Germans for that matter, that they lost, or the Soviets in the Cold War. Why they lost. I mean, why is it necessary? And you said this the last time we were together. Why is it necessary for there to be this explicit understanding that the Palestinians lost and the Israelis won? Because so far, so long as the Palestinians have not lost, in other words, dream of eliminating Israel, how can you have peace? If, as I would analyze it, 80% of the Palestinians believe that they want, want Israel gone. 80%. 80%. What do you base that on? I base it on a whole range of uh, surveys going back to the 1920s. It's a, it seems to be a consistent figure that one-fifth of the Palestinians accept Israel, are work, willing to work with it. Not necessarily lovers of Zion, but yes. accept it. And by the way, that one-fifth has been extremely important. I would go so far as to say that if it were not for that one-fifth, <clears throat> in the interwar period, uh, the period of the British Mandate, uh, between uh, 1918 and 1948, that there would perhaps be no Israel today. They had a vital role in providing intelligence, in selling land, selling weapons, uh, justifying the Zionist enterprise. That was really critical. Did they have a leader? They had. Uh, they did have. I guess not. Nashashibi would be be the main figure, but they were generally uh, scattered. They were never in power. They were continuously harassed, and oppressed, and sometimes murdered by the Mufti, Mufti uh, Hussein Al Amini. Uh, sorry, uh, Mufti Amin Al Husseini, uh, who's who set the tone. Amin Husseini is someone who we've always known about. He uh, died in 1965, but his heyday was from 1921 till 19. 55 or so. And we've always known that he was important. But in recent years, a number of books have come out that have established that he really set the tone both for the Palestinian rejectionism of Israel, no, 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 we accept nothing, no presence, no sovereignty, mm -hmm. no culture, no nothing. We accept everything. We, we reject everything Zionist on the one hand. And on the other hand, he was a major figure in the development of radical Islam. And he was a major impact is a major uh, conduit between the Nazis and, mm -hmm. and the Islamists. And it turns out that the is Nazi influence on the Islamists was much deeper than we had hitherto thought. It's really only in recent years this has become evident. So he was a really important figure. And he set the tone. It's now 90 years. And the tone he set is still a predominant tone. Now it's been modified a bit, uh, not in Hamas, but in the Palestinian Authority. It's been modified a bit, but still the goal of eliminating the Yeshuv and now Israel remains intact among a great majority of Palestinians. And that feeling, that ambition needs to be ended. And the only way to end it that I can think of is through a sense of defeat. You can't win, buddies. Give up. You know, it's forlorn. And so they do. They see they can't win. And how does Israel get to that point? How does Israel get to the point where the Palestinians finally say, we understand we can't win, and therefore willing to engage in a different kind of diplomatic process? Israel gets there in the first place <clears throat> by um, attempting to achieve this. In other words, the Israelis today don't have this on their mind. This is a strategy. What I'm delineating for you is a strategy the Israelis deployed between 1948 <coughs> and 1993 for 45 years. The Israeli policy of deterrence was uh, intended to get Palestinians and other Arabs and Muslims to give up the fight. To find it too painful to see Israel as too tough, too permanent, too well connected, and say, you know, we can't win this. But since 1993, Oslo, Oslo, um, <laughs> now almost two decades, even Israel that's wandering through one policy after another, I can name for you three of them, uh, that don't go anywhere and uh, don't achieve anything. And uh, this is kind of Israel's lost period. And I, I think that's true now as it was uh, then in 1993. If you look at Israeli policy today, you have to ask yourself, what's it trying to achieve? It puts out fires, but it's not, it's not trying to go anywhere. 
It's not trying to win. If I were to summarize my attitude, it, my view is that the Israelis should try and win. Victory, victory. If you don't win, you lose. The Palestinians understand that. Uh, the Israelis don't. The Israelis are trying to finesse it. They're trying to find some way around it. Uh, scheme after scheme after scheme is being developed to avoid victory and defeat. And I say, good luck, but mm -hmm. it can't be done. Daniel, do you support the notion of a two-state solution? No. Because? Oh, well, the Palestinians have had now almost two decades to implement it, and look what a mess they've made. Uh, it has been uh, unmitigated disaster. What's Everything the about them. The alternative uh, that I would prefer, at least for the interim, maybe in the distant future, two-state, but right now, no. It's, it's been discredited by events. I'd like to see, to see the Jordanians in the West Bank and the Egyptians in Gaza, what I call back to the future, because that's the, the way things were between 1949 and 1967. It may not be that easy to arrange for this, but at least it's, it's, it's an idea. Uh, that, and it's no, not ideal, but at least it's something that we can work for. That you want Jordan a, to control the West Bank? Yeah, then there's a, a responsible party. Yeah, it's mm. better, better than the PA. I think the PA, I, I call the PA the good terrorists. The good terrorists. Yeah, Hamas and Gaza are the bad terrorists, and PA and West Bank are the good terrorists. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I, I've dubbed the American uh, effort to train Palestinian security forces the stupidest undertaking the U.S. government has ever uh, engaged in. I mean, we, we're, we are training Israel's enemies. And uh, can't we see this? Can't we see that these guns will be turned against Israel eventually? You know, you make me think of now this tragedy we just saw a couple weeks ago with the Fogel family where my understanding now is that Palestinians trained by American, by America, not that Americans were training Palestinians to go kill Israelis, but that they were trained by Americans, and the Palestinian Authority police facilitated the terrorist entry into Itamar, which took the life of the five Fogels. I've seen reports of that. I don't know if they've been confirmed, but if they are confirmed, then that would certainly make my point that these were the so-called Dayton uh, security forces, and rather than work with Israel, they're murdering uh, uh, Israeli babies, yeah. But, you know, I'm wondering what you think of as you work day to day to day, and everything you read, and everything on the newspaper, everything on television, and I mentioned in the open David Remick's piece in The New Yorker, where he basically says, it is up to Israel now to make peace. Israel must make yes. peace. Israel must make peace and must make whatever compromises are necessary now. It must now. And that the responsibility is squarely and solely on the shoulders of Benjamin Netanyahu, who Remnick seems to feel is hostage to his father's right-wing revisionist ideology, Ben Sion, where Ben Sion was part of the Jabotinsky orientation, both sides of the Jordan should right, be right. modern Israel, and certainly you don't give up the West Bank. React to that whole flap now that has been raised by the Remnick piece. Comparable nonsense. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is, a, is no ideologue, he's a pragmatist, as was particularly clear in his first prime ministry between 1996 and 99, and is again evident this time. Uh, he is a great disappointment to the ideologues. He doesn't live up to what he said he'd do. I mean, he said so many things he'd do, especially in 96, he didn't do. Uh, he said, for example, he would stop the Oslo process because the, the Palestinians had broken their word. He didn't do it. He campaigned on that. Yeah. Uh, he, he was, oh, yeah. Remnick doesn't have any idea what he's talking about. Um, but more broadly, not looking at Netanyahu personally, but looking at the responsibility that you mentioned that Israel's responsible. This is the consensus, that the Palestinians in 1993 at Oslo agreed to accept Israel. And it is only because of Israeli infractions, such as the uh, checkpoints or the occupation, that the Palestinians are not happy. And that is conventional wisdom. And the Palestinians are acting out of their unhappiness by engaging in terrorism, delegitimation, and other efforts to hurt Israel. I flip it completely on its head and say that it was Israeli weakness, or per perception of Israel, not actual weakness, perception of Israeli weakness, that the Palestinians had won something deep from the Israelis. They had won the right to 
build a state, uh, to have their own uh, nationality and area, telephone area code and security forces and um, so forth. That had given them a sense of strength. And it was not out of despair that they engaged in violence, but it was out of anger, exhilaration, and ambition that the terrorism, uh, uh, that drove the terrorism. And I therefore conclude that the Palestinians need to be shown that they're wrong, that Israel's not weak, that the Israelis did not make these concessions out of weakness, but out of a sense of strength, which is in fact the case. And that the Palestinians need to, it's on, the burden is on the Palestinians to fulfill their obligations. The Israelis, you know, the Israelis, they're, they're not angels, and they didn't live up to every last uh, element in those massive agreements they signed. They're hundreds of pages long. I'm not going to say that. But they fundamentally did. They fundamentally turned over territory and turned over tax money and allowed weapons and so forth. And the deal was that in return, the Palestinian Authority would not only end the violence, but would and the incitement to violence and the hatred that lay behind it. Well, far from it. The violence increased manyfold, and the textbooks got worse, and so forth. It's a complete uh, uh, abrogation of the Accords. And I, th I think these Accords and their <clears throat> progeny have no, no future. The way to go forward in the Arab Israeli theater is by the Israelis convincing the Palestinians that the Palestinians have lost. And by the way, <clears throat> when that happy day comes, the Palestinians sense they have lost, understand they have lost. Not only is that a benefit to Israel, which obviously benefits from uh, having no more enemy, but it's also, and even more, I would say, a benefit to the Palestinians. Because finally they lose their obsession with uh, attacking and eliminating their enemy, and they, who are skilled people, can start to develop their own polity, economy, culture, and society instead of uh, focusing on destroying their neighbors. And then things can happen, good things can happen there, but they're not going to happen until they give up that uh, demented obsession with uh, harming and eliminating their enemy. So I think it's the best thing that can happen. It's, it's a little bit analogous. I mean, these analogies are always uh, fraught with, with um, complications, but I would say it's a little analogous to the Germans. The Germans tried three times to dominate Europe. Well, finally they understood that they had failed, and I think Germany is a much better place for not trying to dominate Europe anymore. You know, everybody's better off for that, in particular the Germans. Mm -hmm. You put your finger on a very important element that drives the reasoning on both sides. You're saying to us some 80% of the Palestinian people still either actively or subtly wish to see the state of Israel eliminated in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Netanyahu says on CNN that there are two kinds of Palestinians. Those who want to destroy the state of Israel or those who will not stand up to those who want to destroy the state of Israel. And then those on the left argue that there is now a significant number, even a majority, more than 50%, of Palestinians who, they don't express it the way you do, but have ha realized now that the best way to go forward is with a two-state solution and that the left argues that there is a significant Palestinian population that's willing to live side by side with the state of Israel. How do you, and then you come and say again that that is really a uh, wishful thinking, not the reality of the Palestinian people on the ground. Do I have it correct? Yeah, but we're basically talking a difference in numbers. I'm saying 20% accept Israel, and they're hypothesizing three, four times that. Correct. I say when it gets to three, four times that, then the conflict will be over, to be sure. And I say that our burden, and Israel's burden, and everyone who, who cares to end this conflict in a humane way, is to increase the Palestinian numbers of those, who, the numbers of Palestinians who accept Israel. The alternative, is the elimination of Israel, which I think we can agree is, from every point of view, a disaster. So we want to, I see two final status uh, situations. Either the Palestinians win, there is no Israel, 
Israelis are subjugated, dispersed, killed, whatever it might be, unacceptable, or Israel wins and Palestinians accept Israel and Palestinians build their own polity and so forth. Acceptable, desirable. So all of us, starting with the United States, should push in that direction. We should be asking the Israelis not to defend themselves, but to win. We want our allies to win. Our team should win. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted, uh, I don't know, India or Japan or whoever our allies are. We want our allies to win. Does the Obama administration want Israel to win? Uh, Obama himself comes from the far left background, which is virulently anti-Israel. But he has shed that. I don't know in his heart, but in his policies, he shed that and adopted a fairly mainstream democratic position. Uh, there's not that much difference between uh, Obama and, say, Bill Clinton. There is in style, there is in music. And those who follow the, who are f concerned with the U.S. Israel relationship, I believe, tend to get too consumed by the music, the tone, the style, and don't pay enough attention to the to the policies. Mm -hmm. And I would say Obama's policies are not that bad. I mean, take, take the recent uh, uh, veto at the United Nations of the condemnation of Israeli building on the West Bank. This, this veto was done reluctantly by the Obama administration. The style was not a happy one, but it did it. Mm -hmm. And that's in the end what counts. So I don't see that much difference. I would also see certain continuities between Bush, George W. Bush, and Obama. I don't see that much of a difference. Certainly it started differently with the focus on Israeli building in the West Bank and even in Jerusalem. But at this point, it's not that different. Different in style. And certainly in a second administ Obama administration, he might feel freer and, be, and indulge his um, dislike of Israel. But so far, it's not been that different. Daniel, one of the things you often hear now is that if Israel doesn't make peace with the Palestinians, the international community is going to impose upon Israel the establishment of a Palestinian state on the West Bank. And in the Remnick peace, he is, dis he is discussing how Israel has lost more and more of the world's support and that Israel now needs to, and I'm going to quote him, regain Israel's moral standing among the nations of the world. The only way to do that, Remnick argues, is by ending the occupation. Is it conceivable to you that if Israel does not do something to initiate a peace process that looks like it will bear fruit, the world community could say, in essence, what it said in 1948 when the Palestinian community and the Arab community did not want there to be a Jewish state created. The international community will say to Israel, whether you like it or not, there is now internationally recognized a Palestinian state on the West Bank. There could be. Uh, not in the Security Council. I expect that the Obama administration will Would veto, veto, veto it, this right. too. But um, there's talk of going to the General Assembly and gaining a kind of moral uh, in endorsement of a Palestinian state. Anyway, one way or another, there could be some kind of international endorsement of a Palestinian state. To be sure, uh, and that would be, uh, I think, problematic for everyone involved, in that it, it would probably lead the, the Israelis to say, you have completely abrogated your commitments at the time of Oslo, which were to work through diplomatic process. You've already, you've already broken it, even now, by not being willing to talk. But OK. Uh, you've gone even further by unilaterally declaring an, an, an independent Palestinian state. Well, that's it. You know, it's over. Don't expect any more concessions from us. I don't see how the Palestinians gain from that. And it, hurt, it hurts Israel as well because it, it backs it be Israel. Disaster, to would it be a disaster for Israel? Well, you know, we've had a couple of declarations of Palestinian states before, mm -hmm. most notably in 1988. Don't remember a whole lot changing as a result of it. It's a different climate now. It is different, and that was declared by Arafat, not yeah, by the no, United Nations. Right. Uh, it won't do any good for Israel. But it's part of a broader picture uh, that you were alluding to earlier, which is the um, delegitimization mm -hmm. of Israel, apartheid state and the like. Uh, yeah, that's important, certainly important. Um, but I'd say it's secondary importance to maintaining the security of the state, which would be, I think, eroded by... Uh, agreeing to make concessions to an enemy and handing over more land and giving more benefits to it. Uh, I, 
you know, I, I, I think international opinion is important, but it's not that important. In particular, it's not as important as American opinion. Israel's better off with a strong American support and not the rest of the world mm -hmm. than the reverse. And it has American opinion. It's not necessarily there forever. And I can think of one particular way in which it could be eroded, but it's there now. It's How could it be there eroded? Now. I think there's a possibility that the Palestinians have learned from two things. One, the failure of using violence, which where has it gotten them? And secondly, the massive unrest in the Middle East from Morocco to Iran that has overthrown two regimes now and probably another two in the offing. Uh, they have learned from these two things and they might well, particularly after September and this attempt at Palestinian statehood, they might well decide to use nonviolence. They might well have massive demonstrations. They might well uh, go through checkpoints in a, in a civil disobedient way. They might surround Israeli towns in the West Bank. I don't know what exactly the, the specifics would be, but, but the stress would be nonviolence. Or if there is violence, it would be on the, on the, on the scale of intifada-style violence, throwing up rocks as opposed to murdering a family in its, in its, in its home at night would be violence that's more acceptable. You're saying that might influence American I, th I think especially opinion. if it's really truly nonviolent, it could uh, influence American opinion away from Israel towards the Palestinians. Right now, and for decades and decades, pa the words Palestinian and terrorist have been joined. Uh, they could, and that's been very harmful to the Palestinians, they could break that mm -hmm. and change that. In mm -hmm. which case, I think Israel's standing in the United States would be more vulnerable. There is, at the moment, a tendency to hear by a remnant, by Americans for Peace Now, and for many groups, a moral equivalency. That what you hear is both sides engage in, in horrific behavior one to another. What's your sense of this moral equivalency argument that even though the Palestinians do things that are terrible, Israelis do things that are terrible too? I would say that's the position of the left. It's not a position of the right. It used to be that one could predict a person's politics by more or less by religion. I think religion is almost irrelevant now. What counts uh, is where you stand on the political spectrum. In other words, to exaggerate a bit, if I know where you stand on the Obama health care plan, I probably know where you stand on Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, there's a significant correlation. And you've just if you're pro-health plan, does that mean you're against Israel? You're cool to Israel. Cool to Israel. Yeah. And likely, Isn't that sad, by the way? Likely to adopt the kind of position you just took, mm -hmm. that, you know, equivalent, moral mm -hmm. equivalence. If you're on the right, you'll find very few on the right. Yeah, I mean, there are always exceptions. But overwhelmingly, this is... Uh, what does it mean? What does it say about American mentalities? Uh, it says that there are two different temperaments, uh, one of which is inclined... Well, one of which is proud or of being American and proud of American allies, and one is more critical. And uh, the right tends to be prouder and the left tends to be more critical. Mm -hmm. Must Israel make peace? And I ask it in the context of a very interesting lecture I heard by a woman named Ruth Gavison, who's a professor in Israel, I believe at Ben Gurion University, I'm not sure. And Ruth Gavison, who is a, an expert in law, said something like this, Israel would love peace, but Israel doesn't have to have peace. We've lived without peace since 48. We'll continue to endure and exist if the Palestinians don't want to make peace with us. We want peace, but we don't have to have it if the cost of peace is too great. Then again, I keep coming back to this Remnick piece because it's gotten so much attention. Remnick's argument is Israel must make peace or it is going to lose so much of world support that it will find itself isolated and then the issue becomes will America stay supportive and uh, supportive enough of the state of Israel? But I come back to the simple question, Daniel, must Israel make peace? No, it doesn't need peace. It would be desirable, to be sure, and the Israelis are unanimously eager to have peace, but the terms are such, uh, say the Arab Peace Initiative, 
like unacceptable terms about right of return and uh, territorial adjustments that I, I wouldn't want Israel to do it. Or to take a simple case with Syria. Uh, sure, it'd be great to have a democratic, modern, open Syria, which has had a change of heart and no longer anti-Zionist. It'd be wonderful. I'd say, yeah, give them the Golan Heights. But that's a long way off, if ever. And right now, I'd say better the Golan Heights without a treaty than a treaty without the Golan Heights, from Israel's point of view. No question. Um, Got to wait it out. In other words, it's a matter of timing. To be sure, we all hope that there will be treaties and changes of heart and ending of violence, ending of incitement, and so forth. But it's up to the Palestinians, the Syrians, the Egyptians, and whoever else to come to terms with Israel. That's where I think Israel's burden lies in convincing them that they lost. Gig is up. Give up. Make concessions. Make uh, concede that you've lost, and then things can happen. But until they do, it's stagnant. And I don't see. I mean, it's a perversion to blame Israel for the stagnancy here. It's not. It's not, what can Israel do? As one who has you know, sort of been an analyst and a historian for the last what, 30, 40 years now, Daniel, I want you to comment on two things for me. In Remnick's piece, he suggests that it would be good for, uh, for Netanyahu to be like Richard Nixon in the fact that Nixon shed his right-wing ideology and opened diplomatic relations with China. And Remnick, Remnick writes... Just as Nixon set aside decades of Cold War ideology and red baiting in the interest of practical global politics, Netanyahu would transcend his own history and his parties to end the suffering of a dispossessed people if he were again to end the occupation which Remnick equates with Nixon's opening negotiations and diplomatic relations with China. Is that a fair analogy? Nixon, China, Obama, uh, Netanyahu, Palestinians. No, it's not. For the simple reason that Nixon went to China for, as he implied there, for geostrategic reasons. We're looking for a new ally against the Soviets. So we held our nose and we worked with the Chinese. Where does that, where does that fit here? I don't see it. Uh, there's no geopolitics involved here. Uh, the Palestinians need to accept Israel. As I in indicated before, the Palestinians are still under the sway of the Mufti, still have this rejectionist approach, overwhelmingly, 80% of them or so. That's got to change. When 80% of the Palestinians want Israel not to exist, how can you make concessions to them? How can you ask Israel to make concessions to them? Uh, no. I also don't understand what Remnick thinks Nixon was risking. It, Nixon goes to China. The worst that can happen is it doesn't work out. By the way, Nixon doesn't go to China unless it's already a done deal. But there was nothing in Nixon's going to China that put American citizens or the future of America at risk. If Obama, I'm, I don't like you saying Obama, if Netanyahu makes peace that is not a just peace or a safe peace, he risks the Israeli people, and he risks but the future of Israel. You use my Golan Heights example. Yeah, it's dangerous. And by the way, Netanyahu wanted to turn over the Golan Heights in 1998. Yes, he did. And it was only Ariel Sharon who stopped him. So uh, he is a flexible, pragmatic politician who's interested in getting reelected more than anything else, to see him as his father's son and uh, under the influence of an ideology, I think, is to simplify a much more complex politician. And speak to the other, um, the other kind of analogy I'm hearing. Again, this was put on CNN by Morgan Pierce, who wants Netanyahu to be a Sadat, to make compromises like Sadat made. Is that a fair analogy? <laughs> it's absurd. Sadat was an aggressor and uh, was seeking to eliminate. He fought a war that was seeking to defeat Israel, to eliminate Israel. And uh, the Israelis are permanently, by virtue of their small geographic and demographic size, they're permanently on the defensive. They're not trying to occupy Cairo. 
you know, trying to eliminate Egypt. It's the Egyptians who are trying to eliminate Israel. So no, it's preposterous. These people like Remnick, they don't understand anything. And they just come along and opine and you know, you have an interview. And it's, it's The good thing is that you know, an interview like this or an article like this comes and it goes and it's forgotten. Mm -hmm. The fact is that the American people overwhelmingly, as expressed by the Congress, endorse Israel over the Palestinians or the Arabs or the Muslims. There's a sympathy, a deep sympathy for Israel. The, 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 the worrisome part is that it's unique to the United States. You don't find it in Canada, you don't find it in Australia, you, don't, you certainly don't find it in Britain or uh, throughout the West. It is unique to here. But fortunately, this is the country that counts most. Although the Canadian Prime Minister seemed to make a very powerful public stand for Israel. Certainly, uh, Prime Minister Harper is more friendly to Israel than uh, Barack Obama is. But if you look at surveys of, of opinion, while Israel's not doing too badly in Canada, it doesn't have the strength that it has here. My last question shifts a little bit. I want your sense now of where America stands and the Obama, and the Obama administration stands, not vis-a-vis -vis Israel, but towards fighting Islamic fundamentalism in general. Is America doing a good enough job? Uh, the fight against violent Islamism is going reasonably well. Uh, there have not been spectacular incidents. The ones that have been attempted have failed. Our counter-terrorist efforts are good. A lot of money has been pumped into it, a lot of attention. I argue that had we had today's t attention back in September 2001, the uh, World Trade Center would still be there. In other words, uh, the FBI was more focused on bank robberies then, and now it's focused on counter-terrorism and other police forces as well. So that's certainly improved. The real uh, problem is, and the, where the government does poorly, is with nonviolent Islamism, which I think ultimately is a more successful route to the application of Islamic law. The whole thing uh, can be reduced a bit simplistically, but can be reduced to the application of Islamic law, the Sharia. That's the goal of the Islamists. They want to apply Islamic laws. They want to go back to medieval order whereby Muslims are superior to non-Muslims, men are superior to women, and jihad is a legitimate way to expand the realm of Islam, among other things. And you can do it by blowing things up, or you can do it by working through the schools, the law courts, the media, the political uh, arena, which you think works better. Mm -hmm. Blowing things up, how, how is that going to achieve what your goal of applying Islamic law? I mean, here and there can put on pressure. But it takes the long-term dedication to expanding Islamic influence. And that's done, as I say, through political means, not violent means. And that's where the government is blind and cannot perceive it, uh, and is apologetic and uncomfortable and so forth. And that's where, that's where the real work is. So those of us who back in the 1990s, pre-9-11, were working on counterterrorism issues, have abandoned that, basically in favor of working on the nonviolent form, because that's where the action is now. I mean, the government's doing a, a good job on the violence issues, uh, violent threats, and so we who are outside the government, you know, who don't have its $30 billion at, at our disposal uh, annually, uh, are, are trying to awaken understanding and interest in the nonviolent version. So it's not Khomeini, the violent one. It's Erdogan, the prime minister of Turkey, who is nonviolent. It's not the terrorists inside the country, it's the groups and individuals who are working in a nonviolent way that are the real problem today, the, the conceptual problem today. Mm -hmm. Daniel Pipes, it is always such a joy for me Thank to you. sit with you. You're a lovely human being. You, you bring insight that we normally don't hear. You have a very interesting perspective, and you educate us whenever we listen to you. I wish you'd call Duva Hatzlacha. You, you go from strength to strength. And sit with me often. I love you Look very much. To it. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. And those are the thoughts of Daniel Pipes, director of the Middle East Forum and one of the world's leading experts on Middle East affairs and Islam. I hope you enjoyed hearing Daniel's analysis. Of course, as always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments to the ideas expressed by Daniel Pipes. Please email me, write me, reach me through Facebook or Twitter. I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.
We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who can send a tax-deductible contribution of $36 or more to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media to help support our programming. Tax-deductible checks may be made out to GEM and mailed to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. Please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD, and we thank you for your kind support.